everybody, a happy D&D celebration and welcome to the How to Become a D&D Designer panel. I am your moderator today, uh, as well as your friendly ethereal brand manager over at Dungeon Masters Guild. If this is uh, your first time meeting me and hearing of Dungeon Masters Guild, uh, then a brief introduction. It is your go-to marketplace uh, for... Um, uh, all sorts of D&D 5th edition adventures, supplements, player options, rules, variants, anything you can imagine. And you can even license 5th edition D&D yourself and publish your own things. But enough about me. Let's meet our awesome community creators on our panel today, uh, starting with the lovely Ashley Warren. Hello. That was perfect timing because I was adjusting my lights. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley Warren. I am a storyteller and narrative designer and uh, co-author of uh, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frostmaiden, and I'm excited to be here. S something that we are celebrating here today. Speaking of, let's move along to Celeste. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Celeste Conwich. I am a Dungeons and Dragons designer, podcaster, streamer, all around lover of uh, tabletop role playing games. Uh, I was also one of your co-authors uh, for Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and I am super duper excited uh, to be talking with you all today. So and celebrating uh, this this awesome event. So thank you all for being here. Awesome, thank you, Celeste. Last but not least, Justice. Hi, uh, my name is Justice Orman. I'm an Iranian-American D&D designer based in Central Texas. Uh, I've been creating on the DMs Guild for a little over a year from now. You might know me from uh, Devil's Advocate, A Guide to Infernal Contracts, or for my work at Beetle and Grimm's, where I make super dope D&D box sets with that awesome team. Yeah, I see folks in chat saying, oh my goodness gracious, this panel. And yeah, <laughs> we are loaded with talent here. Uh, we're gonna go through and talk about everyone's D&D design origin stories. Um, but as everyone's talking, folks in chat, let us know, um, are you an aspiring designer? Are you someone who's just started creating your own things? Do you have no idea how to get started and you want to know? Let us know so we can cater this panel to you. Um, and do know that in the last 20 minutes, we're going to take a question. Uh, we're gonna do a Q&A section. Uh, so we'll hopefully answer any questions that uh, we haven't answered uh, just through our, our fun panel stuff. <laughs> Words are hard. Um, but yeah, uh, how about we'll start with you, Ashley. How did you get started writing D&D? Uh, my journey began uh, a few years ago in 2017. I had been playing D&D for a few years at that point, and I was just really inspired by all of the official content that was available. Uh, my group was playing through Curse of Strahd, and I just loved the genre, and I loved the atmosphere, and I was like, hmm, I could maybe write something cool like this. And then I learned about uh, Dungeon Masters Guild, which is a platform for people to publish their D&D adventures. And so just knowing that that was available to me certainly helped me get started. So I just started writing adventures and publishing them on DMs Guild. And then it's been kind of a wild roller coaster since then. But yeah, I don't really know what kind of pushed me over the edge. I just was excited about being able to tell my own stories in you know, the, this, these epic worlds. And uh, I loved the idea of being able to kind of produce a whole adventure on my own and also kind of be the creative director and, and kind of um, envision this whole thing from start to finish. So that was really uh, enticing to me. Awesome. What about you, Celeste? Yeah, so I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons for 12 years or so now. So I have always just loved uh, fantasy and been obsessed with the books and the games and the movies and, the, you know, every aspect of it. And I can remember when I did start reading, uh, you know, these D&D &D books, I just thought they were so wonderful and they made me so happy and I wanted nothing else in the world uh, other than to write these books myself. Uh, so really, I mean, that all started pretty early. Um, and then over the last few years, uh, about five years ago, I started a actual play D&D &D podcast called Venture Maidens. And, you know, getting to write these stories and stream them and record them and put them out there into the world was really what gave me the confidence to actually start, you know, taking my stories from the gaming table and then actually making them 
playable, you know, writing them for people and starting to publish. Uh, so really, the last five years have been my my real journey uh, to step from, you know, player, DM, to actually publishing these adventures. Um, so that's sort of my, my story in a nutshell. Um, but I mean, I've I've always been, you know, perpetual dungeon master, and so it felt like a, a very natural step for me to take the leap into uh, into publishing and sharing content. Both of you, that's like so inspires inspiring that you just like took the leap, <laughs> and now here you are co-authoring the book uh, that we're celebrating for D and D celebration. Uh, yeah. What about you, Justice? What's your origin <laughs> story? Um, so I have been a dungeon master since about 2014. Um, and I when I would do these Halloween one shots every October and my notes are so long that I thought, hey, there's this TM Guild place I heard about. I could throw it up on there and see what happens. And then I forgot about it for like nine months. Uh, and then MT Black was doing this contest where you could uh, do a one page adventure. And I logged in to get my DM Guild uh, email address for the for the contest. And I had money in there. I was like, where did this money come from? Was I hacked or something? <laughs> was it a bank error in my favor? Uh, and then uh, I realized all these people had, you know, paid me for my work. And that experience was really uh, inspiring and it, it was empowering. And I wanted to do more of that. And it gave me confidence as a writer to kind of move forward. Um, so all of you have shared with us how you got started. But in the beginning, everybody makes mistakes. Are there things that you wish you could go back and tell early you, sort of like D&D &D designer 101 advice? Uh, sure. I mean, I made lots of mistakes. <laughs> and I mean, that's kind of the nature of uh, independent publishing in general. You just kind of put work out there and see how it's you know, perceived and then you make changes and you learn for the next time. I would say that I should have made more use of the official settings as I was starting to write adventures. I was trying to do a lot of like world building and, and things, which I think is, is fun and rewarding, but I don't think that needs to be a writer's like very first project. And so I think that um, just making more use of the, the IP that's available to us, especially through DMs Guild is a, a good first, a good starting point for, for for new authors. So I used a little bit of that, um, especially by you know, using creatures in the monster manual, but I think I could have made more use of, of the settings and, and the characters that are part of this, you know, many decades of, of lore. So yeah, I, I have been trying to do that ever since, but starting off, I, I thought you had to just create everything from scratch and you don't have to do that. So you can let your creativity run wild without having to recreate the wheel. That's great advice. Um, Celeste or Justice, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would definitely say uh, I wish that I hadn't tried to go it alone for my first few, uh, you know, writing forays. I, I found very quickly after I tried to do a couple things by myself that working with a team or collaborating on bigger projects or anthologies was seriously the best way that I, I could learn how to do this. It was so much less stressful uh, to actually work with people who already knew what they were doing than rather trying to just invent the wheel. <laughs> Uh, all by myself. So I wish I had jumped onto more team projects um, starting out. That's something I, I feel like would have made my transition a little bit easier uh, into the world of uh, writing. But luckily, I stuck with it and I did manage to get on a bunch of those group projects and I have had just such a wonderful experience um, learning from people who know the ins and outs of publishing on the guild, who know everything about layout and editing and writing. Uh, so uh, I, yeah, I wish I had gone that route first. <laughs> I think I would have had a little bit easier go of it. Collaborative projects are such a huge part of what makes Dungeon Masters Guild special. Um, sometimes folks refer to creators as publishers. On Dungeon Masters Guild, specifically, they're community creators, and there really is a really big emphasis on community. But before we talk about collaborative projects, I want to give uh, Justice an opportunity to chime in on whether there's anything you wish that you could tell past Justice. Oh, uh, many things. Uh, I would probably echo what S Celeste said. Uh, I mean, D&D is a team game, uh, and that spirit pervades all aspects of the industry. I think over the past six months, we've all learned how devastating isolation can be and uh, for our productivity and our health. 
Um, so, I mean, not only will your products be better for collaborating, you will get better. You'll you'll learn from each other. You'll uplift each other. Uh, and you have all these party members ready to support you when you don't have the spell slots to write for the day. Um, and also hire an editor because <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, there are all sorts of different types of collaborations, I'd say, on Dungeon Master's Guild. You could find like a small core group of people who you really vibe with creatively um, and collaborate with them on a number of projects. But there's also really huge anthologies where like tens, maybe even like a hundred creators are working together. Um, so a question for all of you, our panelists, how do people who are like, oh, well, that sounds great collaborating on something. How do you even find out about it? And then how do you make sure you're a good collaborator? Um, sure. I think that there's a lot of ways to join collaborative projects, uh, one of which is their, uh, the DMs Guild Discord uh, server has I feel like almost every day someone's like, hey, I have this idea and I'm looking for collaborators. And you don't necessarily need to provide, you know, a resume or some, you know, lengthy portfolio to join. You just basically offer your skills and you can get involved pretty quickly. And as for being a good collaborator, I definitely think that uh, being respectful to your fellow, uh, your, your creative peers and making sure that you can meet deadlines. So don't overcommit to things that you can't actually uh, deliver on just because that is hard for everyone else to have to to make that out but also understand that these projects are fun and even if even when there's money involved they are often voluntary so just uh kn know that we only see a little part of each other's lives online and so sometimes um just being a little bit flexible goes a long way and i also think that it's important to uh have contracts even for these fun and somewhat informal projects just to make sure that everyone um is, is on the same page about what what the expectations are, but it really just comes down to be nice, be cool to other people. Don't don't be a jerk. I think we'll carry you very far. Good life advice yeah. in general. Um, Celeste, you sort of sang the praises of collaborative projects. Um, how did you find those first few that you got involved in and how do you ensure that folks want to continue working with you? Yeah, I mean, so the the big way that I got involved in in writing in general, and honestly, the Dungeons and Dragons community online was actually through podcasting, uh, because I was running, you know, Venture Maiden streams and podcasts. I got involved in that community, and I got to start meeting other streamers and podcasters, which led me to talk to people who were interested in streaming and podcasting Dungeons and Dragons, which really just opened up the the doors to just getting to meet and interact with so many wonderful people people um, that were so interested in Dungeons and Dragons. So that's really how I found my first connections uh, to find these people to collaborate with uh, and to, you know, talk to people who wanted to make a thing and, you know, were maybe interested in me, you know, helping make the thing. Uh, so really, I mean, Discord, Ashley mentioned, is a phenomenal way uh, to interact with people and to, to meet these individuals who are looking to create projects. Um, so, you know, get involved in, in shows, get involved in streams in those communities and interact with creators online if you support their work and talk to them um that's that's a lot gonna open up a lot of doors um for you meeting other people to work with and collaborate with so yeah being nice being kind supporting other people who make stuff is a great way to get involved in these communities because frequently you know if you're following this one talented person somebody else is following that person and maybe the two of you can talk about why you liked this adventure and then maybe you could make your own adventure uh based on that theme so so really following the people you admire um and being a positive force and voice in their communities is a great way uh to find like-minded individuals yeah i feel like there are two really important things celeste just brought up that i kind of want to emphasize the first is that i feel like it used to be in previous generations that like you had to kind of be at the right con mm -hmm. at the right bar after the day at the con talking to the right people rubbing shoulders with the right people and there are completely new ways to network um, in this new realm of the interwebs, uh, but also that you should do 
you should be quote unquote networking, not necessarily to get stuff out of it, but to like genuinely support other people in the community. Um, and I feel like the other thing that is kind of related uh, is that you don't have to necessarily come through this just from, I don't know, having like a degree in writing and English or history of, and you don't have to necessarily start as a writer. If you enjoy mm-hmm. streaming, there's a lot of folks who are coming through different avenues um, into D&D design. It's really a whole new world. Mm-hmm. Um, Justice, I've personally really enjoyed watching you go from having published your first things on DMs Guild to being so involved in the DMs Guild and D&D community online. You ask lots of like really interesting questions of the community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with collaborative projects? Yeah, um, so first off, I want to give a shout out to my good friend, Anthony Joyce. Uh, He's an Army strategist that I've worked with on over five projects now, um, and of whom I enjoy a wonderful friendship. Um, I'd say that, you know, uh, as Ashley and Celeste have mentioned, um, you kind of need to try to be in the spaces where creators are active. Um, Another thing that I've seen over the course of my time on the DMs Guild um, are these big kind of call outs for, for projects. Um, you know, someone will say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing something where we're going to make 100 sidekicks. Um, and you can submit here at this Google Forms link. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're around when those kind of calls go out and you don't really know where to find someone or you're um, not the kind to interject in a conversation in a Discord, well, um, having the time to kind of sit back and, and submit, a, you know, an application, so to speak, um, can be a really great opportunity. Um, and then when you kind of have your feet wet and you've, you know, been on a few collaborations, you can start to lead your own. Um, I mean, Ashley, I know, has done some collaborations that are huge, uh, like Uncaged, and brought on all kinds of new people to the guild. Um, and you kind of pay it forward by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Justice mentioned um, that people will do calls for collaborative uh, for collaborators. Um, sometimes they'll even do calls specifically for people who either haven't done anything on DMs Guild before, mm-hmm. um, or who have published things but they haven't earned any best-selling medals yet. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And if you are interested in finding where those calls happen, a few resources that I'll mention are on Facebook. There's a Dungeon Masters Guild group uh, that we moderate uh, that is meant for creators. There's also a page which is for creators and also customer facing. Um, And then on Twitter, uh, we're at DMs DMS underscore guild, but hashtag DMs guild is really, really active. Uh, And when folks are doing those calls for creative talent, uh, they are usually using that hashtag. Uh, So I would give that a follow. Um, All right, I'm noticing a few questions touching on our next subject. Uh, So hopefully we can answer some of those questions. Let's say you have, you've got the inspiration, you've written the thing, you're, you've laid it out and you're brave enough to hit that publish button. What happens next? How do you get people to know about your work out there? Tell, talk to us about marketing and promotion. That's kind of a broad question. Uh, Who wants to jump in there? (laughs) Start with prayer. (laughs) (laughs) um i will take that or i'll start this one i guess i should i work in marketing for my day job so i guess this is (laughs) a topic that i like um but i do think that marketing and promotion is something it's its own skill set so i think a lot of new writers do struggle with it a little bit and that's totally understandable there's something that feels a little awkward about talking about ourselves sometimes and and promoting our work it feels like we're you know shoving into people's faces but that's really not the case it's creating and publishing your work is a huge part of the process but it's not those aren't the only steps and people will only really engage with your work if you tell them about it so it's it's important for writers of all stages to have a marketing plan and a marketing plan can be really really simple it doesn't have to be this like really like intricate strategy document it's basically just like i'm going to post to twitter a couple times a week i'm going to you know make sure that i'm active in certain communities you you can pick the platforms that you want to spend your energy on you don't have to be present on all of them just pick the ones that you enjoy and where you most like to uh, network with other people and that's usually a good place to start but it's important to know that even if you feel like you're talking a lot about your projects 
people won't know about it unless you keep talking about it. So a huge part of marketing and promotion is just consistency and posting the same things, you know, in, in different ways, but more than just once and expecting that to just be it. Like you can't just necessarily post one tweet and expect that to, um, you know, really expose your work to lots of different people. And I would say that just a huge part of it is through word of mouth. So the more that you can network with people and develop the relationships with people in the community, um, that's great because those people will then share your work. And when you have those, those, you know, genuine relationships with people, they will want to support you and share your work with others. So it's definitely worth putting in the effort to develop friendships and uh, professional relationships with people in this community as a marketing strategy. And just because it's a good thing to do. <laughs> That was like about like a million great tips. I hope folks are taking <laughs> notes. I wanted to call out, especially where you mentioned that uh, I feel like a lot of people feel bashful about promoting their work. Um, and honestly, if someone is following you, they probably want to know about the things that you are creating. And on certain platforms in particular, um, especially Twitter, feeds are so ephemeral. Um, a tweet is there and gone. There's probably going to be a bunch of people who didn't see you post that one time you posted something. So you can remind people, retweet your own tweets to bump them up in the timeline, that sort of thing. Uh, now, Celeste, you have marketed um, not only the different individual publications on DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG, but even like a whole Kickstarter. Uh, so I'm really curious what your insights are. Yeah, uh, whenever, you know, people ask me about, about marketing, it's Honestly, marketing like my podcast has taught me a lot about how to market my products as well. I mean, the first thing you you need to do is develop a really strong identity of what it is, what the quick pitch is. Uh, and then you need to be able to represent that visually and then in a concise and very easy to understand way. Uh, so branding is everything and you need branding for whatever the product is, you know, even if it is just like a subclass that you have. I need to be able to understand what's cool about the subclass class just by looking at the photo because um, people don't assume anybody's going to read what you're saying um, but visual <laughs> visual cues are great uh, so come up with really what is the core of what you have made and how do you pitch that in a way that's visual how do you pitch that in a way that's very easy to understand in one sentence you should be able to sell your product uh, and if you can do that then you are going to get a ton of traction uh, based on that um, my other piece of advice that I always have is to team up with people. Uh, so really look at the market you're in and find, you know, if you have friends or you have other folks who are starting at that same level, you know, they're publishing their first one or two products on the guild, work with them to cross promote uh, your, your projects, you know? So if you team up and you're retweeting their stuff, uh, they're retweeting your stuff, and then maybe, you know, you have a stream where you play through one thing or, you know, you, you go to a smaller podcast and ask, you know, hey, would you like to run my adventure? Just rely on other people um, because, you know, the, the more people have eyes on this, the, the bigger your audience grows. And, you know, if, if you go to one other person, well, you know, at least like their mom and their best friend is going to buy it and your mom and your best friend bought yours. So, you know, if you work together, that's four people who are going to buy your thing. And, you know, it's the it's the math as it goes on and on from there. That is some really great advice. Uh, what about you, Justice? First off, my mom has bought a lot of my DMs. <laughs> so my mom has bought all of mine too. So yeah. shout out moms. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I would say, yeah, uh, you mentioned this, Lisa, the average time of a tweet, I think, is around 18 to 20 minutes before it's just gone, unless there's some sort of traction to it. Um, and uh, as Celeste mentioned, uh, tweets that have some sort of visual to them, uh, I think have 33% more engagement. Um, the good news is, is you don't even have to be on Twitter to, to market your uh, products, though it helps, uh, because there are over 40 million people playing D&D worldwide. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think there are these people that are outside of spaces that we kind of um, forget about. Uh, they're like kind of in the null void. They're maybe, they're not on Twitter. They don't really engage on Facebook. Uh, there are people who have built huge audiences on places like Patreon um, who, you know, they don't go other places. Um, but I would say that the, kind of at the center of it is, um, one is don't get discouraged if you put out a tweet or a post or something like that, and it doesn't get a lot of engagement um, because everybody's been there. It's going to happen to you no matter 
how successful you are, there's gonna be posts that you have that are duds uh, and you just need to find a way to say something new or say something in a different way, say it at a different time um, and be kind of uh, vigilant about, about getting out there and posting. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to the DMs Guild, um, there's a phrase that uh, things have a long tail, essentially, is when you put out that first project, if it doesn't get a lot of attention, your next project will market your old projects. And over time, you might get one or two sales a week or a month, but a year later, that could be $50 for something that you wrote a long time ago. Yeah, that's, oh gosh, you guys all had a lot of advice <laughs> about marketing um, and promotion. So we've basically talked about getting started. You've hit the button to publish. You, you've you made sure people know about that you hit that button uh, and that they should go uh, buy your titles. Um, so what comes next after you've published your first thing? Um, talk to me a little bit about how you make sure you stay inspired and motivated. Um, but also talk to me a little bit about burnout. Is that something that you've dealt with and how? Um, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Celeste. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, sure, let's break the order. Um, yeah, so yes, uh, burnout is something that I think everyone experiences. So if you have ever felt frustrated or like you sit down to write and you just can't do it today, you are not alone. Every single person has that. Uh, even even the big names on the guild, even the people who are publishing these giant campaign books. So first off, I just want to say you are not alone. Everybody goes through this. Uh, and you know the the goal is to when you do hit those moments of burnout, try and identify what it was that drove you to that point and what you could have done for yourself to prevent getting to that place next time. Um, and a lot of that is really developing a structure that works for you. Unfortunately, there isn't like a fix all solution for everyone's burnout that, you know, it's a band aid across the board. It, it really is getting to know what you, about yourself, uh, about how you work and what works best for you. And then identifying, you know, when you're straying into the danger zones or not. Like for me, uh, you know, I struggle with attention issues. So setting strict routines and only allowing myself to work in short bursts and then making sure I sprinkle in other activities I've learned has become key uh, for me being able to write anything. Because if I try and sit down and write for, you know, eight hours straight, I get so burnt out. I, I don't love the projects I'm doing anymore. I hate it and I want to walk away. And that's, uh, of course, not great. Um, so, so really learning to manage my time and do these enjoyable little bite-sized sections of work <laughs> has become, you know, make work a cupcake instead of having to eat a whole cake. Uh, because if you eat a whole cake, it's great for the first, you know, quarter, and then you're so sick <laughs> and you, for like a week, you're so sick and you don't want to do it anymore. Uh, so that has been really, really key for me, just learning those routines, learning what works best for you. And uh, you do have to keep trying things to learn that process. Um, so, I mean, I know my first like three months, I, I've been full-time freelance designing for about a year now. And the first three months of that were so hard, just trying to figure out the routines and the rhythms. And uh, quite honestly, I'm, yeah, about at the year mark. And I think I'm s just now feeling comfortable with, with what that looks like. And, you know, sort of starting to understand the schedule that works for me. So stick with it. Uh, it's going to be hard, but listen to yourself and trust your instincts is my, my best advice for avoiding burnout. That's really great advice. And I feel like there's probably a lot of folks listening in chat or catching this VOD later where the dream for them is to be that full time game designer, freelancer. Um, so I feel like hearing about your experience is really topical for them. And I also think that's a really good point that the source of burnout for people isn't necessarily the same, which means that when people are throwing advice out about burnout, if you feel like something doesn't work for you, that's not a, that's not a thing about you. It just means you need to figure out why you're burnt out and what works for you in particular. Um, I'm going to continue going out of order uh, and see if Justice has anything to add. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so I'd say uh, it, really common in this industry is, is FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, you see somebody that you admire or some really cool project gets announced, or maybe you've got three projects on your plate and you see one of those Twitter calls go out about something that seems awesome. 
I'll tell you this, um, fear of missing out is is not as bad as working yourself to death, not getting sleep, or feeling like you can't be in the community anymore because it's too stressful. Um, so know your limitations. Mine is about two to three projects. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but I know that's a lot to me. Um, so it might be different for you. Just know it. And as Celeste said, evaluate it regularly. I mean, that that changes from time to time. And you kind of want to leave a buffer in there because you never know if you've done something really awesome recently, then you take on five projects and somebody contacts you about your dream project. You either have to say no to that person mm -hmm. or disappoint somebody you've made a commitment to, or, you know, do one of those awful marathons where, <laughs> you know, you're not getting as, as much sleep or not taking care of yourself. Um, so I'd say set boundaries with your work um, schedule a time on your calendar that says for this hour, I'm going to go play a video game or I'm going to, you know, drink some tea and read a book or, um, you know, just do some self-care exercise, you know, uh, getting out of the house for a little bit when, you know, the pandemic is over. Um, but yeah, that's that, the end. That fear of missing out is so real. And I think especially for someone where you've published your first thing and maybe it's taken off and now everyone's reaching out to you with different mm -hmm. opportunities. You don't know what you feel like. You don't know if that well is going to dry up and you have to say yes to everything. I think someone that a lot, something that a lot of D&D freelancers do is say yes to too many projects very early on in their career. Like, yeah. honestly, like if you're on this panel and you've done that, or if you're in <laughs> chat and you You've done that please raise your hand um can i okay, raise I was like, oh, gosh, more hands okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um so yeah that is a situation a lot of people find themselves in so if we can warn you um if you do it anyway you no know you're not alone um yeah. ashley do you have anything to add yeah i feel like those are all great points and i totally um agree with all of that and i will say that like cre creativity is not a race I totally get the FOMO, but there will always be opportunities available to you, I promise. And I also saw that someone in the chat said that um, they were surprised that some of us have day jobs. I have a day job. I do a lot of this work as my side hustle. And I think that that's especially important to have balance because when you do have a full-time job or fam family obligations, like D&D &D content does not need to always take precedence over uh, important things in your life and it's okay to have that balance and I I think it's it's exciting when you publish your first piece because you do have that you do feel empowered and excited to continue creating but it's okay to work up to some of those bigger projects you don't need to take on every single thing that comes your way and just remember that you're we're always practicing our craft and so if you can continue to do you know smaller projects and really build up to those bigger projects uh you'll you'll be rewarded by just improving as a writer and also keeping your scope uh, reasonable because burnout is hard to recover from i think for the past three years i mean up until earlier this year i had about a deadline a week for a lot of projects and well, i feel stressed it was, it was, yeah, I just never really want to do that ever again because it, it was hard even when it was fun and even when the projects were dream projects, I just, I did get to a point probably late last year that I started to crash and I, I've been a professional writer in some capacity my whole life. So you would think that I would know my boundaries, but I, I think that we, we do get excited, but it's still work and it still can be mentally taxing. And even when it's, it's, it's fun, it's, it's still, you know, can be hard on our brain. So uh, my personal philosophy now is to have like a two day buffer during the week, like at least two days during the week where after work, I don't have to work on anything. And so I don't accept more projects if it means that I would have to cut into that time because usually what I end up needing that time for is like, if there's a family emergency, like my cat needed surgery last year when I was right in the middle of a bunch of deadlines and I just felt like I was gonna lose it. it just, I just felt totally overwhelmed. So um, I think that's, learning how to uh, prioritize is its own skill set. And as new creators, uh, we don't need to be in this like, you know, this roller coaster of, you know, the, the highs and the lows. You, you can have a more stable uh, and fulfilling uh, creativity path, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, Justice, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I'm, this is my You're finger signal. Finger. Um, <laughs> I, I would say another thing too is um, there's, there's nothing wrong with communicating with the person that reaches out to you. Um, where your actual deadlines are and how to work in the schedule. I recently had somebody that I was on a project with and I said, look, I, I can't do this unless it's after this day. And they were really understanding. And I would say that 
um, you're going to succeed as as you write and as you become a de designer. And um, if someone really wants to work with you, they'll still they'll still want to work with you after that day passes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so so just be clear with them, and and they can help you out how they can. Yeah, I think communication is so key. Um, oh, Ashley. Oh, gosh, both of you. Yeah, I think we're, we're <laughs> all like, like yes. Um, for <laughs> popular Ash, question. Uh, this is this is this is huge uh, for you know because we have been talking about getting started and collaborative projects. Communication is the most valuable thing you can learn to do when you are first starting out because also you don't know how long it's going to take you to write. Most of the time, you don't know because you're you're learning. You know that that's new so the the thing to do is cultivate being honest uh with yourself and with others from the get-go so you know if you're a week into your project and you know you have a three-week deadline and you go hey I, I you know what i don't think i'm gonna be able to make this in three weeks could i extend that deadline the easier like the sooner you can communicate that uh is is great um because you know a, a, people running these projects would much rather hear you say hey i need to get this to you five days later than the initial deadline a week into the project or two weeks into the project than the night before. So, you know, just just being clear and upfront with what you can and can't do with yourself and with others is huge because um, people are going to remember that about you. They're going to remember that you were honest and straightforward with the, how much time and space you needed or they're going to remember that you were the person who didn't respond to them three days at the end of the project about, hey, where's where's this? And and you you knew the whole time you weren't going to be able to do it, but but you just didn't do it. Um, people remember those things. It's a very small community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it feels very large, but it is very small. So that cultivating that honesty and that understanding and that straightforwardness will do you huge favors uh, down the line. Very, very good point. Uh, Ashley, did you still want to chime in? Yeah, I just have one more point, but I think at least for me, this has kind of become a good strategy where if I can't do a project that I'm invited to do, then I try to pass the opportunity on to someone else mm -hmm. because it yes. both helps your community, you're developing relationships with other people, uh, you're giving someone else an opportunity. There's really nothing better than that when you can pay it forward. And it know, you know that someone cool is going to do the project that you couldn't necessarily participate in. So I think when it comes to FOMO, it's not always, we don't need to be involved in every single project. Not every project like lights our souls on fire. And I think that if we are selective about the things that we participate in and can know our fellow creators strengths enough to recommend them to other projects and it, it kind of helps keep our own priorities uh, a little bit more manageable because we only commit to projects that we're really truly excited about and other people get to do cool stuff yeah uh, make, making someone else's dream come true and handing like another a project that you think they'd be great at mm -hmm. is such an amazing feeling so good. Yeah. it's so good yeah <laughs> um i'm really glad we got to spend a little bit of time on that topic because honestly creativity and self-care really go hand in hand especially mm -hmm. if you're thinking of making a career of it um so thank you everyone for that advice okay are y'all ready for some q a Yes. All right. Born so ready. if you have additional questions, our lovely mod TK has been collecting all of the ones so far. So I'm going to go through and skip ones we've already answered. Uh, but if you have a new question, put question in all caps at the beginning and TK will see that and grab that for us. Um, but here's a question that came early on from David Bastionson. Uh, what sort of writing products are best to start out with? Is there a particular format you recommend? Uh, I would say something small and something manageable. Mm -hmm. uh, if yeah. if you if you can go for it, especially if you're doing something by yourself, um, starting with something that's like a cool new subclass or like ten magic items or mm -hmm. you know ten new spells, something very small and manageable, because that will also do you a lot of favors for marketing. To mm -hmm. go back to that too, because if I say, hey. I did 10 new necromancy spells. That is so easy to tell people what it is, where to go. Uh, people know if they want it or not immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are doing bigger projects, um, again, just just something that has a, a very specific theme and scope. Uh, so you know what it is. So rather than a world book, which is probably the farthest end of don't start with that, uh, you know, you, you have something that you have like, oh, five adventures that all are themed around taverns mm -hmm. you know something a very easy pitch uh that's very easy to understand that's the best type of thing to start with yeah 
I totally agree with that. I think that a pitfall for new writers, and I don't want to deter anyone from their dreams, but is is taking on a project that's too big um, when they've never completed any sort of creative project like that before. And then realizing that it is pretty hard burning out and then giving up. That's like tragic. And unfortunately we see that sometimes in the RPG writer workshop, which is why we usually start with, you know, a one shot adventure as the starting mm -hmm. project, because it's manageable, it's achievable. <laughs> and it's, it's something that when you finish it and you publish it, it feels really good because you've, you've seen something through to completion. So yeah, there's really nothing too small. Uh, I mean, justice wrote an awesome one page, you know, ad adventure encounter for the empty blacks uh, contest. And like you, there's lots of ways to create really meaningful and memorable work that doesn't have to be a full book and you don't have to start there. So yeah, definitely uh, start with something small and finish it and publish it. I guarantee you'll be really excited and you'll, you'll want to do bigger projects soon after that anyway. Yeah. Justice, anything to add? Uh, I think Celeste and Ashley gave perfect answers and I don't need to add anything. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll move along to the next question. <laughs> so confident. From, it is so wise. From I am an omelet uh, asks, Ooh. is it smart to get really good at one thing or okay at a bunch of different skills first? Hmm. Um, and now I wonder if that's meant as like types of design or if it's meant as like skills like writing, editing, layout. Um, anyone have thoughts on that? Um. I, I guess I do. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about um, earlier in collaborations about knowing um, who to recommend for what. Um, I think that there are a few people I know on the guild, this person is very good at mechanics and this person has a great eye for pros. Um, but I would say if you always do um, one thing, if you only ever make spells, you might get bored. Um, and I think that goes back to burnout and self-care is it's, I think it's awesome to try to master something, but there's always something new to learn in this industry and with writing and the rules, the formats, they're all changing. New ideas are coming out and being recycled. Um, so it's great to be good at something, but you know, feel free to branch out, try something new and uh, yeah, that's the end of my answer. <laughs> 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 um, nice nailed it yeah i would uh you know whenever people email me about new projects or getting involved one of the first things they always ask me is like oh well what kind of writing would you consider yourself good at and i'm like mm? uh because my <laughs> my strategy very early on because i knew i wanted to go full-time freelance which is an incredibly hard thing to do because the pay is not great and you have to take a lot of jobs. So my strategy was to write everything possible to get proficient at it and to make sure I had something published to show these people. So now whenever I do get one of these emails and someone's like, what aspect of design would you say you're best at? And I'm like, well, would you like to see my adventure work in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden? Or would you like to see my Cobalt Press Bestiary books? Or like, would you like to see my adventure I just published on the DMs Guild? Uh, just diversify your skills, um, trying a little bit of everything is really important to show your stuff uh, because every once in a while you are going to have those people who want to work with you but they've already hired somebody else to do the adventure. So they need somebody to do the monster stat blocks. So if you have at least, you know, one experience uh, getting to do that, that gives you a one up. And as an added benefit, every time you get to design something new, you learn whether or not it's something you love or something you don't like so much. Uh, because that is super helpful for me in structuring my projects. Like I know, you know, this month, if I have two monster writing projects, for example, uh, and an adventure, like I know I can handle those three different products mm -hmm. because I know how I design monsters and I know how I write adventures. So really diversifying and getting to experience all the different aspects of design is really, really important. And I would say, focus on that if you can. If you can get involved in projects that will allow you to expand your skill set across the board, absolutely do it and prioritize doing that. Mm -hmm. Great points. Um, Ashley, did you want to add anything else? Um, I mostly agree with everything that Justice and Celeste said, especially about um, knowing what types 
of writing require different kinds of like energy. And I also think that's good for preventing burnout because the types of projects that you commit to uh, might vary in the types of writing that they require. And I know for me personally, like there are certain things like I'm not great at stat blocks. So something like that would actually probably take a lot of my mental energy. Whereas if someone asked me to write like, you know, three pages of, you know, setting lore or encounters or something that is like no problem for me personally, just because I enjoy it. So I know that uh, my time and energy commitment might vary based off of that, but I only really learned that by trying a little bit of everything. So I think as you are starting out, that's actually a good way to get started is write, a, you know, a subclass, write a couple of creature stat blocks, write, um, you know, a one page encounter, write a one shot adventure and really kind of build up your portfolio by having all these different things. And then you'll know, oh, I really liked doing this particular project. And maybe that'll be like my emphasis. And that will also help you find opportunities that will um, be focused on on what you enjoy doing most. And then you also have a nice little portfolio showing that you you can do more than just that one thing. So, yeah, I think that's kind of a good uh, way to just experiment with the different forms of writing in this space. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. So the next question, it's actually Wait, a number. Just, oh yeah, oh, go ahead. Just real, real quick. Yeah, Celeste, well, we're bringing, we're bringing up, uh, in chat about learning like writing, art, layout, editing. Mm. Um, so I, I got a degree in theater and something they say in theater is that, you know, if you're going to be on stage, you also have to learn what it is like to be backstage, what it is like to do lighting, what it is to do design. I would recommend if you can trying out every aspect of the design process, because even just giving it your honest try and trying to understand what it's like will help you work with a team later down the line. So if you've at least, you know, given a run and seen how horrible InDesign is to do layout in, oh. you will understand the problems yeah. that your layout artist is facing uh, and, and know better how to work with them and how to communicate with them. So if you can learn these skills, you know, try your hand at editing, try your hand at like sourcing art, try your hand at everything, um, just so you can be a team player um, is my recommendation. I'm really glad you interjected because that was a great point. And it kind of all comes back to being able to communicate clearly with people. Um, okay, so the next question is actually like a bunch of people asked similar questions. So I'm gonna frame it in two ways. Um, but folks are asking stuff like, well, how do you know when you're ready to transition from like homebrewing stuff for your campaign to actually publishing stuff? Mm. And then related, uh, folks are wondering, well, what's really the difference between like preparing notes for your campaign versus preparing a published like module or 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 supplement. Is everyone trying not to interrupt each other? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I have lots of uh, thoughts. <laughs> yeah, so, so the biggest thing, uh, the biggest difference that you're dealing with is because when you're a DM and you're writing your campaign, you are doing it for the group of players that you know. And, you know, it's a group of people that you've played with before and you are writing specifically for them, you know, these, these two to six people, right? And when you are writing for design or to, to sell something to a larger market, you are writing for every person who might open this book. And, you know, at first you you think, okay, well, this should be, you know, translatable, but it's it's very difficult because your goal as a designer when you when you publish is to write something that is so easy for anyone to pick up and run. That's that's your only goal is to make something simple uh clean and easy typically when i whenever i write something i will write a first draft and i go back through and i go would a 13 year old child understand how to run this and if they don't then i've done it wrong so i'll go back and i'll edit and i'll change i'll make sure the box text is something that a 13 year old could read uh you know it's constantly going back and simplifying and honestly writing Writing for publishing is a lot more akin to writing technical manuals than it is a beautiful story. Uh, whereas as a dungeon master, your job is to make that beautiful story. So uh, that's sort of where the, the differences come into play for me. Ashley, I know you had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Celeste said everything so beautifully. It's just, yeah, it's, it's true. When, when we are DMing our own games, like I know my notes for a session are like, I don't know, three lines of maybe this encounter, maybe this will happen. And that's pretty much it. But when I write in an adventure module, I have to account for all the things that the DM 
doesn't know. Like things that are obvious to me at my table would not be obvious to someone who's, you know, running the notes version of my adventure for, for their group. So you have to account for all those things that the dungeon master needs to know that we kind of make assumptions about when we're DMing. And of course, every DM is different. Some have, you know, pages and pages of, of notes and um, lots of world building. But for, I mean, Celeste basically said it, it's, it's a technical document. So everything that a dungeon master needs to know to, uh, play out that uh, scenario at their table is what goes into that document. So it's not, I think they're quite different to be honest. I think that a great DM can of course be a great writer and vice versa, but I really truly believe that they are separate types of storytelling that of course have similar goals, but they're different mediums really. Uh, Justice, what about you? Uh, I think their points were really great. Um, I, I would say for the first question, when are you ready to make that leap right now? Go for it. I mean, there's, you should jump in and, and move from homebrew. Uh, the question is, is, um, I mean, what do you want to publish? And uh, you can take a small piece of something you've written, maybe a variant rule, uh, maybe a location or a few NPCs, uh, but take to the guild. I mean, it's the best thing about the DMs guild is that the barriers to entry are so low. You don't need to run a Kickstarter campaign. You don't need to uh, have a lawyer on hand. Um, you really just focus on the best part of it, which is writing about what you love and making it happen. Um, so if you're waiting right now and you're thinking, I'm not good enough, my writing isn't up to par, well, I thought the same things when I got started. I still think them now. You can do it. Just go for it. Yeah, we talked about FOMO really being real, but also that imposter syndrome, so real. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you mentioned like, well, what if someone thinks, well, what if my stuff isn't good enough? Another great thing about Dungeon Masters Guild is you can publish something, people can give you feedback, and then you can update your files and that gets pushed into everyone's library. So they just automatically get that awesome, better version um, that maybe they helped contribute to uh, leveling up, uh, which is yeah. exciting for them as well. And again, kind of getting, circling back to that community aspect. I'm um, okay. I think we might be able to squeeze in one more question. Um, so the one I'm going to pick is from one GAT, one GAT. Um, and they are asking, what advice would you give to someone looking to hire artists for a project you want to sell on Dungeon Masters Guild? And if you actually recommend working with like different resources or other like websites, what of which of those would you recommend people check out? Well, <laughs> trying to be polite. We're all too polite. <laughs> I'm so polite. So I nominate you. I just did this on Dragon Talk too. We were like, hey, you go first. It was just two of us. It's even worse now. <laughs> um, I mean, really finding artists, you can find artists on lots of social media platforms. They're usually um, people who would say that they're open for commissions. So, you know, peruse the D&D &D tags or, or, you know, any game system that you're looking for art for. Um, make sure that you can pay artists what they're worth. You know, art is an important skill, just like writing and sometimes um, artists are undervalued in you know geek communities like ours and it's uh, just have open lines of communication and be clear with you know what you're you're hoping to get out of the collaboration and i think it's really great when you can find an artist that you that you really gel with and and maybe build a partnership and collaborate on on future projects but it doesn't have to be out of reach um, i think that budget you know, can be a factor, but that doesn't have to uh, deter you from reaching out to artists. There's lots of ways that you can you know, split your royalties or, or find other ways that um, work for everyone. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, oh, oh yes, um, getting starting out, uh, it is it is hard um, to get these art assets, and you know, you you do always have to compromise with because paying artists what's their what they are worth is is difficult when you are starting out. So learn what free resources are out there. Learn what the different licenses are for how you can use art. Um, really, even just a quick Google search education on the Creative Commons and what. What these are and what they mean uh, is going to do you a world of good for understanding what you can and can't use. Uh, and then also just keep your eyes out out there. There are lots of amazing collections of art that uh, DMs Guild folks can use. Uh, some people have assembled these these incredible Patreons where usually, you know, you pay a, a fee and you just give some credit uh, and you get access to a wealth of uh, images that you can use and are all 
general uh, fantasy images that really help you make your first few products. So just do your research, get out there, make sure you know with your whole heart if you can use something or not uh, before you use it. Uh, and just, just learn about the options out there. Great advice. Justice, anything to add before we roll into outros? Yeah, um, so I'd say uh, sometimes it's good to look for art first and write around the art asset. Mm -hmm. um, if something is free or really cheap, um, it doesn't have to be the character or the you know the um, situation that you imagine. You can tweak it, and suddenly you have an encounter that um, you had to pay significantly less for. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you're going to reach out to artists to talk to them, um, don't don't try to negotiate an artist down. Don't try to talk about exposure with them. Ask them what their rates are. Um, be clear with them about how much you have to offer and what you're looking for. And if that's not enough, you know, move on to a different artist or or try to find a, a different you know, way to, to get that art. There are, uh, Google Images has a filter, so you can go based off usage rights and you can uh, look for royalty-free art, go in and then confirm that that is in fact royalty-free art. Um, there are Patreons who the artists will grant you a free license for maps and uh, art um, to use in your products. And um, also, if you're willing to do the hunt on ArtStation, you can look for a piece that's already been completed and then reach out to that artist and say, hey, I know you did this for a daily sketch a few years ago. It's actually perfect for something I'm writing. Can I license this piece from you? And if so, uh, how much would you like for it? Um, I think those are all other ways you can go about than the traditional um, start from scratch. That is some great advice, both in terms of etiquette, uh, reaching out to artists, uh, but also other like resources and ways to find art. Um, panelists, thank you all so much for sharing your wisdoms with us. We are going to go in backwards order and do some outros, let folks know where they can find you on the interwebs. Um, and if there's anything you're working on, we'll start with Justice. Oh, no, I'm first. Um... <laughs> Well, my name is Justice Armin. You can find me at Twitter uh, at Justice underscore Armin or at my website, www.justicearmin.com. Um, I'm always pretty active on Twitter. I post, you know, role play warm ups on Fridays and stuff. Um, and then I'm, I'm working on a few box sets with uh, Beetle and Grimm's and uh, some uh, a Kickstarter that's going live next month uh, called Nazi Dracula Must Die, which should be a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Celeste? Uh, yeah, hey, uh, once again, my name is Celeste Conowich. Uh, the best way to keep up with me is to follow me on Twitter, at C Conowich. But if you want to see the full catalog of everything I have written, everything I am streaming, everything I'm podcasting, check out my website, celesteconowich.com. Uh, you can always check me out running, uh, DMing uh, the Venture Maidens podcast if you're into actual play D&D &D shows. And uh, yeah, also, I hope you all are enjoying Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Uh, you can buy that, uh, preferably at your local game stores. Uh, so uh, great. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and don't forget to uh, register to vote. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yes. Um, Ashley. <laughs> Yeah, I've been Ashley Warren. You can connect with me on Twitter at Ashley N H Warren. And I would like to invite you to join the RPG Writer Workshop, where we cover pretty much everything we talked about tonight and then some. Our next Write Your First Adventure Workshop comes up in November. So if you go to RPGWriterWorkshop.com, you can check out our open courses that are open now and find out uh, about our upcoming workshop. It's always a lot of fun. We had 4,000 people participate in the July workshop. So we have an awesome and active community. So we hope that you consider joining. And my personal website is scribemind.com. The word scribe and mind smooshed together to be one cool website. Um, and that's where you can find all my personal projects and my blog and my Patreon and all the other fun things that I try to find time to do. Thank you again, everybody. I've been Lisa Penrose. I'm your brand manager over at Dungeon Masters Guild. Follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter at DMS underscore guild. Um, but I think uh, coming up next is Acquisitions Heckin Incorporated. Uh, yeah. So everybody stick around for that. It's going to be, I'm sure, hilarious and wild. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy thank the rest you. of D&D celebration. Bye, everybody. Yay.